Hello and welcome to the January 2020 podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name's George Miller, and in this programme I'm talking to Hisham Yeza, editor-in-chief of Ceasefire magazine, about what went wrong for Britain's Labour Party in last month's general election. As the title of his article in this month's issue asks, was it really all about Brexit? The Tories under Boris Johnson won a resounding victory in December 2019 and went from being a minority government to one with a commanding majority. The Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, had gained an additional 30 seats in the 2017 election called by Johnson's predecessor, Theresa May, but in last month's vote, it lost 60. Retaining just over 200 seats in the UK's 650-seat Parliament, it was the party's worst result since 1935. As Hisham writes in his article, Constituencies in the old industrial heartlands across the Midlands and north of England turned blue after being Labour strongholds for decades. Labour's red wall had fallen. After more than three years of wrangling over Brexit, the Tories' manifesto could be boiled down to just three words, get Brexit done. So, I suggested to Hisham when we spoke, it wasn't surprising that many people treated the election as a rerun of the Brexit referendum. The irony, of course, is that Labour's policy platform included this promise of a second referendum. And this referendum sort of happened. This second referendum happened through the election, although on terms that were completely disastrous for both Labour and for the Remain cause. The Remain voting parties essentially got more votes, but because of the uh, electoral system, and this is something that I didn't really get a chance to get into in my piece, but the way the British electoral system is set up is such that essentially it completely doesn't really reflect how how people vote in 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 a quite a variety of ways and yes this was the for me the the brexit the, the message the tory message get brexit done has to be understood in the context of the political and media landscape in britain uh, that message would never have survived a week let alone an entire election campaign had it faced the sort of scrutiny you'd expect uh, that you would be subjected to in, in other circumstances. And going into the election campaign, I mean, Theresa May had hubristically called an election hoping to get a thumping majority and had ended up losing one. And the predictions going into the, the December election were that the needle might end up somewhere between a, a hung parliament and a small Tory victory. Now, did you, as you were sort of talking and, and watching and, and thinking about it, did, was that your sense too? Did you share that sense that, that was probably going to be what was returned? Or, or did, you, did you think that maybe something, something more profound might be happening based on some of, the, some of the factors that you talk about in your article? Well, I mean, nobody saw the, the, the actual result come in. I think very few people saw the, an actual strong majority, uh, you know, significant majority of 80 as a likely option. I think hung parliament was, was where most of the predictions sort of coalesced. And my conversations, I mean, I was talking to, to a friend of mine who, who was a Tory supporter, and he basically was extremely you know, gloomy and thinking that this was absolutely an election that the Tories were going to end up with, you know, with the hung parliament leading to another election you know, a few, few months down the line. That was how a lot of other people from you know, Labour supporting or, or uh, perhaps more uh, apolitical backgrounds where we're also seeing the prospects of the election. So it was a very, very shock, very shocking sort of outcome in that sense. For me, the, the election result, the 2019 election result, in many ways uh, has to be read in, in combination with the 2017 result. A lot of people saw the 2019 election as delivering the result that people expected in 2017. Theresa May was very explicit in, in, in Parliament a few days after the results. He said, this is what should have happened when she had called the election. And of course, the reasons why we had in 2019 what we didn't have in 2017 and, and vice versa are worth getting into. If, if I had to give a one word answer, it, it would be Brexit, uh, although it's not by any means the, the full answer. Yes, I mean, I, I wanted to, to talk about that because 
both of these elections occur in the aftermath of the 2016 referendum. Both of them occur when the Tory party, you know, ostensibly in control, but but in a, a state of disarray and the country profoundly divided and uncertain about what's going to happen over Brexit. And yet the results seem to be, you know, seem to have come backwards, you know, according to to what you what you might expect if you'd been asked to to predict. I mean, to put it as simply as this, why did Labour have a, a powerful surge in 2017 and why did they fall away so dramatically in 2019 rather than the other way around? OK, so the 2017 result, I think the short answer is that Labour ran a much better campaign that it's adversaries anticipated and that meant that essentially it had this six-week window where it had hostile media coverage of course but but nowhere near what what happened in 2019 but it had a a fairly decent opportunity to to present its case uh that combined with with a very significant own goals by the Theresa May campaign things like the dementia the so-called dementia tax and, and so on. And that combination essentially allowed for, for Labour to, to completely take, take the Tories by surprise. And had the election in 2017 continued for another week, had the campaign run for another week, we could easily have had a, a Labour victory. In 2019, the two major things that have changed are, number one, Brexit was suddenly a fault line between the Tory and the Labour offer. So, Whereas in 2017, you couldn't really tell the difference between the two parties on that position. Both of them were committed to honouring the referendum result. In 2019, you had one party that essentially centred an entire campaign on getting Brexit done. So it became de facto the Brexit party. Whereas Labour had a much more cogent, but of course also a more problematic position of calling for a second referendum, which essentially yeah, did not win it the amount of Remain Tory voters that it needed to compensate for the Labour Leave voters they had lost. The second factor was the treatment of Labour, that the terrain was a lot more hostile than in 2017. I'm talking I'm thinking of say the the right wing newspapers, you know, the Daily Mail and so on. They did not take the same approach that they did in in 2017. The hostility to Labour had been unrelenting from the beginning of the campaign and, of course, even before then. And the statistics show that the hostility, the media hostility to Labour in 2019 was, you know, magnitudes higher than, than it was in 2017. You've already mentioned the anomalies created by the British electoral system, the first past the post system. You also write, interestingly, about the the fact that the votes in the referendum map rather uncomfortably onto the sort of national map of of leave and remain. So you've got a majority of Labour voters having voted in the referendum to remain, but a significant number of constituencies where there is a leave majority and is trying to sort of square that, that circle that's proved impossible and has led to this crumbling of the, the red wall. I mean, it's one of those things that are hard to explain to, to people who are not familiar with the British political system, but that particular premise that, that, that you mentioned, the fact that Labour started, you know, came to this election with this, with this conundrum, with this paradoxical puzzle they had to, they had to deal with, which is that two thirds of its voters in the referendum voted remain, yet they were in constituencies, you know, two thirds of which had voted leave or at least areas that had voted leave. And the, the only reason this happens and this is possible is because of the electoral system that allows for, you know, the distribution of votes to be a lot more important than the number of votes, so to speak. The electoral system, the way it's set up now, is extremely, extremely stacked in favour of essentially the, the, the way the Tory voters, the voter base is distributed. In, in essence, older uh, white voters in in rural areas in towns and so on have a lot more um sort of voting weight than people in uh, urban urban and and um so, sort of middle class areas in in cities and this is something that is that precedes 
the current election. It's it's a it's a pattern that has been in the making for for for, for decades. If you listen to some commentators, you might think that you know the sort of economic and industrial profile of Britain hasn't changed since the 1930s. You know, that they're talking about, you know, industrial heartlands and the north as though most people have factory or, or heavy industry jobs there. And I think your piece is interesting because it points out that it's not simply about Brexit. There, there are demographic changes happening and there are economic changes happening. And the changes in voting patterns are reflective of those things as well. Absolutely, and I think it's one of the, the the least understood and the least talked about aspect of the of what's happening in, in Britain has been exactly the, the the two trends and patterns that you mentioned as on the age demographics issue. It's an extraordinary shift that that a lot of this sort of red wall area has seen over the last three decades. Places like Bishop Auckland and, and so on have seen a remarkable shift from essentially the the, the number of pensioners, uh, the over 65 population has, on average, gone up by by a third, which is which is enormous in places like Workington, Bury, you know, Darlington, uh, you know, all these places that that Labour has essentially uh, sort of lost to to the Tories, and that's been combined with a shift, you know, an exodus of of the young population in the 18 to 24. Uh, segment in, in particular, precisely because of this other shift in in the fact that the economy, the economic landscape has has completely shifted. You know, Britain is no longer a country that makes things that that has manufacturing as as the core of its economic engine. It's now completely centered on financial services and and and, and other service sectors, and this has meant that these areas in the north are no longer you know the industrial heartlands that they were. Those places which did, you know, succumb to the promise that, that Johnson was making to them, what was it that do you think that appealed to them in what he was doing? Was it simply the, the get Brexit done or was there, was there something else? Because, you know, you say in your piece that, that Labour had a lot of policies that people, you know, on a, on a one-to-one basis, taking them one at a time, responded to very favourably. And yet that didn't cut through, but something that Johnson was was offering clearly did cut through. Yes, I mean, the, 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 that's the one uh, thing that has to be put at the heart of any analysis of the election results. You know, Labour's policy platform has been, has been popular. I mean, it's been tested, you know, in, in poll after poll. Most of the signal policies that Labour had on offer, you know, the renationalisation of the railways and, and so on, are popular with the public. The explanation given as to why this didn't cut through, uh, so to speak, is is has been you know we, we didn't trust Labour to be able to actually deliver on these promises. That's not for me what what lost it for Labour on on this term. The Tory offer of get Brexit done was understood in in ways that go beyond Brexit, by which I mean that a lot of people who voted for for the for Boris Johnson and for the Tories were, in my view, trying to essentially send a message that they were against the direction, the way they saw the direction of Britain, not simply in economic terms, but but also in cultural and you know socio-cultural terms as well. And this is inextricably linked to the perception of Labour, and especially of Jeremy Corbyn, as representing some sort of a vision of Britain as, as you know, a multicultural cosmopolitan uh, that is you know that has that has come to represent a lot of what many people in the north and the midlands have have come to see as you know the epitome of what's gone wrong in britain over the last few decades i remember talking to a friend in uh, nottingham uh, who was telling me that you know they wanted britain to go back to how it was and when i you know, asked them to to explain a bit further what they meant by that, and they said, you know, Britain used to 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 earn respect. You know, Britain used to be a nation that had its weight around the world, and what's happening now essentially is is uh, you know, it's a weak country that doesn't really have a particular you know identity. And you know, the the more you know, I had of these sort of conversations, you know, it was clear that this was around this 
these shifts that that Britain ha- has seen over the, over the decades, you know, demographic shifts, but also you know, in terms of the you know ethnic composition and and the cultural shift away from what are could be seen as traditional British values, you know, by by a lot of these people. So that's that's for me like it's the, this this cultural component is extremely important to understand why. The message that Boris Johnson was delivering, however crude and however simplistic it sounded to some, actually did resonate because people understood get Brexit done as, you know, get Britain back. It did seem to me that there was a lot of indulging in in dog whistle tactics, greater use of the union flag. I think I I can, you know, it, it seems to me quite a recent thing to have prime minister with with union flags in the, in the background when he's being interviewed and things like the police college appearance where he was making an overtly political statement but flanked by the police i mean any any one of those things perhaps on their own may not seem significant but it do, it does seem to me as though there is a a quite a significant shift in the way the tory party has positioned and and presented itself you know and that that goes hand in hand with with what you've just been saying well, absolutely, and you you can track down the the patterns and the and the and the shape of this election around the uses of the word patriotism. Uh, if you look at the word patriotism, the way it's been used in the media in coverage by politicians themselves, it's remarkable. I mean, this is a word that you know, fifteen years ago was was almost, you know, not just unused but unusable. You know, it's something that that raised alarm bells immediately. And now it's been used as this sort of demarcation line to sort of signal, uh, and as you say, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of dog whistle politics, but a lot of it is, is quite explicit uh, that, you know, perceptions of Jeremy Corbyn often were portrayed in, in, this, in this way in terms of him being, being you know, lacking patriotism. It is one of the remarkable features of British politics you know, that patriotism has come to represent essentially this this very narrow vision of of essentially antagonism to foreigners rather than uh, actual belief in 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 any sort of positive understanding and conception of of the nation. Um, you know, Jeremy Corbyn. You know, if you look at the the messaging that Labour has put forth, you know, a lot of it is you know for the benefit of the many and so on. By any sort of reasonable standard definition of the word that would fall under the, the term of patriotism. And yet there was no association of, in those terms, you know, patriotism was, was immediately seen as, as the, the domain of the Tory party, even though the, in terms of policies, in terms of the actual impact on people's lives, you know, after nine years of austerity, it's extremely difficult to understand how people would vote Tory, despite the impact of Tory policies and the Tory government without understanding the how potent and effective this framing of, of politics around the issue of patriotism has been. And yes, it is uh, evident in the use of things like, you know, the Union Jack and so on, and, and the, the, the visual grammar of, of how politics is done. And it's certainly seen in, in the media coverage, you know, the accusations against Corbyn have have been in large measure around you know this this notion of him as being more interested in and more interested in what happens abroad than than in Britain which is completely belied by the actual facts of his political record certainly as leader but this is a perception that has been absolutely impossible for for Labour to to shake off and for Corbyn to shake off and and it has been it has proved absolutely um catastrophic in terms of the result the the effectiveness of the Tory strategy was such that they seemed to more or less escape any thoroughgoing scrutiny of their record. I mean, this is a party which has been in power for nine years, and yet Johnson seemed pretty much to get away with presenting himself as, you know, a, a fresh start, a clean pair of hands, someone uncontaminated by the by the past, and 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 was never really um, well. We know that he he avoided difficult encounters, and therefore he he got away with that um, that that sort of outrageous piece of t- t- trickery. Absolutely, and I think it's it's extremely important to explain and to say that it's not just that Boris Johnson got away with you know, lack of scrutiny and, you know, avoiding having to account for the Tory record. He was allowed to, 
which is which is for me the most problematic and the most alarming aspect of of this. The Tory strategy wasn't some sort of unique, brilliant, um, Machiavellian uh, sort of innovation. It was relying on, in great measure, on the not just complicity but but active participation of an entire political and media uh, system. You know, the vast majority of of newspapers. You know, the most the most read newspapers, whether it's the, the ones in the Murdoch stable, whether it's the, the, the you know the right wing uh, newspapers owned by the the Telegraph Group and 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 so on, have all essentially you know gone into one party mode. You know the if you if you'd read the coverage of the newspapers over the period of the campaign, you'd you'd be amazed that this was was a democracy. Um, and it might sound to to some readers as as a bit of of an exaggeration, but any examination of the of the newspaper coverage of the media coverage and that includes also the bbc and, and the broadcast media shows that the lack of scrutiny of the tory record has been absolutely baffling and and really it's in my view one of the signal failures of of this campaign uh and it's something that bodes quite badly for the time ahead because essentially the one of the major levers of of holding the government to account was malfunctioning uh, for the vast part of the, 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 the last few years. So what would you say has changed? Because this country has had a predominantly right-wing press for a long time. But, you know, you were saying earlier that, that this campaign was marked by much more virulent, vitriolic attacks on Labour. So where do you see that shift as having originated and what do you see as having caused it? The simple answer is the major shift in, in the way the media coverage of Labour has changed is, is Corbyn. I mean, Corbyn represents a marked shift from the standard Labour leader as far as, as most of the right-wing media is concerned. He's not Ed Miliband or, or, and certainly not Tony Blair. Uh, historically, Labour leaders have had to endure hostility from the newspapers. This is true. But uh, the... The treatment of Jeremy Corbyn by the media is, I mean, its magnitudes, you know, in terms of how how hostile it is. And this, in large measure, is due to two or three aspects of of the Corbyn leadership and what Corbyn represents. One of them is the fact that Corbyn is the first major party leader in the UK to be explicitly against Britain's foreign wars and of Britain extending its its military power overseas as a de facto part of the of the British political sort of makeup. Jeremy Corbyn is explicitly starting from the point of view that war is, is to be avoided at all costs. This is something that is extremely extremely problematic for the British establishment and and makes Corbyn essentially unacceptable as an option in a way that say Gordon Brown wasn't. Another reason why Corbyn was was treated with such hostility was the fact that of course he was much more radical in his vision in, and, and much more transformative so the, the way that the the Corbyn leadership the Corbyn Corbyn's labor have been talking about recasting the economy along the lines of workers ownership of of shares nationalization so on this is a conversation that five years ago was unthinkable. I mean, people now have gotten used to the idea that, that you know, nationalisation is a, is a valid policy offer. This was completely unthinkable, you know, five, six years ago. And this is one of the, for me, the major achievements of, of the Corbyn leadership, you know, however, however much of a failure the, the, the record has been in terms of electoral terms, but but the shift in the national conversation around what is possible in terms of the, I mean, you know, as the, the political scientists call it, the Overton window has shifted significantly in the last five years. We're now just over a month on from that electoral defeat for Labour. Where do you think the Labour Party stands now in terms of thinking through what's happened and deciding where it goes from here? It depends who you ask. I mean, at the level of the mem- of the membership, of course, there is a huge sense of gloom and uh, sort of 
it is a difficult time for for many Labour members because you have to remember the election. You know, it was held in December, not the ideal of sort of conditions of of most elections. You know, it's it involved an enormous and unprecedented number of activists, uh, up to half a million. You know, around the country. You know, knocking on doors and canvassing in cold, wet evenings for weeks on end. So there is a lot of dejection and and a level of disillusionment, not just with you know the this particular result, but with politics in general. You know, I've spoken a lot of young people who have been politicised and uh, in the Corbyn era, and as a result of Jeremy Corbyn's ascent to the leadership. And there's a quite a few of them who are not quite sure whether they want to continue in this vein. However, there's also a lot of optimism and a lot of people who who are determined to pursue and who see this election as as a pivotal moment in terms of learning lessons about how radical transformative change can be achieved. For many people, the key thing that has to be done now is to learn the lessons, analyze the reasons for the result, and the fact that you have Brexit as such a a, a massive distorting factor in this election result gives many people, myself included, reason to believe that this is a bit of an outlier. And in terms of going forward at the level of the leadership, a lot depends on what the analysis of the result is and what the diagnosis is. If the result in 2019 in December, if that result is seen as as an aberration, as some people see it, that I think, of course, the course of action forward is to continue with with the current policy platform and to simply try and tweak around the edges. And if, as many of Labour's right and centre-right believe, the 2019 result is a return to normalcy and a confirmation of their analysis of the, of the chances, of the electoral chances of something like the Corbyn movement, then we will see a return to centrism, and which I think would be disastrous for Labour. At the moment, we have the the likeliest sort of outcome of the leadership election is a victory of either Keir Starmer or Rebecca Long Bailey. Now, both candidates have explicitly positioned themselves; they're fairly aligned with with the direction of the of the party under Corbyn. The significant difference being that Keir Starmer is a lot more, quote unquote traditional in in its in his international policy and i think for now the direction of the party in the next few months is not going to make much difference to to its future prospects i think what really will matter is what happens 2 or 3 years down the line when the fallout from brexit when the boris johnson administration starts to feel the impact of its of its policies uh, and uh, the electoral impact of its policies, you know, in Scotland, in in various uh, regional, you know, uh, local elections and so on. And this is when Labour will have to make its move for, towards the next election. And it's not clear to me whether the Labour Party will learn the right lessons. Um, my fear is that Labour, or at least some in Labour, are seeing the election result through the wrong lens, in that they are... Because of their hostility to Corbyn, they are willing to discard a lot of what made Labour so popular in 2017. There is a, a very important point that has to be made. Labour's result in 2019 was a disaster. It was catastrophic. Uh, in terms of seat tally, it was the worst in, in a century. But at the same time, there needs to be a sense of perspective. Jeremy Corbyn in 2019, in this election that is supposedly, you know, the worst in in living memory and so on, still had a higher share of the vote than Ed Miliband in 2015, uh, Gordon Brown in 2010, Neil Kinnock in 87, Michael Foote in 83. And his result was a lot nearer to those results in terms of seats as well than he was to the 1935 election, which many people have been referring to. So... There is a sense uh, in a lot of the analysis that this defeat was was sort of completely beyond the realm of of what has been achieved before, but it has to be really put in perspective. And Jeremy Corbyn, if you combine the two elections that he's fought, has done actually much, much better 
than than certainly people have have said he would uh, at the start of his leadership. And what this tells us is that Labour, under the Corbyn direction, has been able to hold a coalition that has eluded many similar parties across Europe. The Labour Party today is a bit of an outlier in Europe. The coalition it represents is a coalition that has broken in many of the countries, whether it's, you know, in Greece, whether it's in France, you know, with parties like PASOK and, and, and Le Parti Socialiste have, have completely collapsed. Whereas Labour has been, and the Corbyn has been able not just to hold on to its coalition, but to, to grow it for a significant portion of his leadership. The 2019 result, you know, it's a bit of a shock to the system for the party, but I think it would be a huge mistake for it to discard you know, the entire approach because of this. I was talking to Hisham Yeza about his article, Was It Really All About Brexit?, which is in the January 2020 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. It's also available on the website at mondediplo.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read every edition of the paper going back over 20 years, as well as exploring other resources, such as maps, images, the podcast archive and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of content online to entice you to become one. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world, behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.